Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for tuning in to today's Friday Forum. My name is Audrey Stewart and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to today's event with Peter B. Kaufman discussing his new book, The New Enlightenment and the Fight to Free Knowledge. Q&A will be moderated today by Peter Suber. Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Through virtual events like today's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our new digital community during this challenging time. Every week we're hosting events here on Zoom and as always, our event schedule appears at, on our website at harvard.com events where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you would like to buy a copy of The New Enlightenment and the Fight to Free Knowledge, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you so much for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in the virtual gatherings this past year, uh, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now I am very pleased to introduce today's speakers. A writer, teacher, and documentary producer, Peter Kaufman works at MIT Open Learning and Knowledge Future Groups. Previously, he served as the Associate Director of Columbia University's Center for Teaching and Learning and as a consultant to the Library of Converse, Congress's National Audiovisual Conservation Center, the largest archive of moving images and recorded sound in the world. He currently serves as a member of the editorial board of The Moving Image and also the editorial advisory board of the Russian Library, an initiative based at Columbia University Press to bring out more Russian literature into English. He is joined today by Peter Suber. Peter is the director of the Harvard Office for Scholarly Communication in the Harvard Library. He is the director of the Harvard Open Access Project in the Berkman Klein Center and senior researcher at Berkman Klein. Today, they are presenting the new enlightenment and the fight to free knowledge. Today, the giant corporations of our age work to control not only us, but our access to knowledge. These corporations are part of what Peter calls the monsterverse. This book maps out the opportunities to mobilize for the fight ahead of us. With the internet and other means of media production and distribution at hand, knowledge institutions like universities, libraries, museums, and archives have a special responsibility now to counter misinformation, disinformation, and fake news, and especially efforts to control the free flow of information. Michael Scammell says about it, Kaufman's brilliant exposition of the need for an online fifth estate and his ardent support of an online creative commons are both timely and convincing. Everyone who draws on the web for research and intellectual inspiration should read this book. And on that note of praise, I'll turn things over to our speakers. Peter, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, shall I go? Yeah, go um, for it. Great, thank you, um, Audrey, for such a generous introduction. Thank uh, you all uh, here today um, for coming out to hear us. A special shout out to Carol Horn uh, from the bookstore, whom I met uh, 30 years ago, literally. Um, and uh, also to Peter Suber here, whose work has been inspiring me and others in the Zoom, I know, um, for decades. I'm grateful to have a chance uh, to talk about my book, uh, my first, uh, at such a distinguished venue. The book begins with torture and ends with a vision of another violent civil war. There's some gun violence in here. There's some beheadings, tanks rolling over people, 
really something for everyone. Um, let me make five points to help prompt some discussion. First, we are in the middle of maybe just coming down from, or maybe who knows, with a new Trump social media network heading up again into a peak information disorder right now. It's an epistemic disorder. The health pandemic that we are in uh, today, um, it's like nothing we've ever seen. The economic and jobs crisis we've plunged into, the unhinged political violence we are witnessing in our national and in our state capitals uh, are all a function, a direct function, result of the severe information disorder we find ourselves in today. A result of the fact that lies are everywhere. The big lie about the election, still very much with us, but also thousands of millions of other lies, big and little, big about COVID, the vaccine, inequality, injustice, you, you name it. Now, just over half the people in the country believe in angels, you know, so it's a tough laboratory uh, we live in. We're trying to do something about this kind of stuff. Um, just under half the country believes in evolution. Um, now, you know, about that, when you look around sometimes at some of our political leaders, you know, yeah, they may have, they may, have, they may have, uh, but anyway, more seriously and egregiously, uh, we're in um, crisis. We have more than half a million people dead uh, here at home because they didn't believe in science in part. We've caused so much damage here and around the world by circulating and allowing false information to circulate that shame should hang on us uh, from now um, to the end of time. And you're not born believing this madness. That's like the main point, you know? You're not born believing that white people are superior to anybody else. You're not born a Trump voter or any other kind of voter. You're not born an anti-vaxxer. So these ideas, they come from somewhere, they start somewhere and they get propagated um, sometimes endlessly. Uh, um, maybe we can do something about it. The second point is um, my book makes the point that we've seen this before. Uh, the book uh, uh, opens with a guy getting strangled uh, and a guy getting burnt at the stake in an auto de fe. It's the same guy actually, um, because he wanted to share real knowledge. The book opens in the 16th century. William Tyndall was his name. And his thing was to translate the Bible so people could read it and hear it in ways that the apparatus of the crown and the apparatus of the church did not want it read, did not want it heard. Worship back then was a little like television now. But television and newspapers and magazines and the web all together uh, once a week. It was like listening to our conversation, this presentation, whatever, today, maybe one or two others. And that's all you had for media representing the outside world for the week. Worship was your media. I'd be here probably alone back then, standing probably at a pulpit, reading stuff to you uh, from the same book every week. Um, a book that looked like you know, uh, this, um, and no other book, just the same book every week. If it were my book, that'd be great for sales, Harvard bookstore, you know, um, but actually, no, you couldn't have your own copy of this book, uh, the Bible here. You could not buy it. You could not own it, not in the original languages, and especially not in a language like, um, English that you could understand. No, uh, um, Another guy in Tyndall's time gets burnt at the stake also uh, for having the Lord's Prayer in English written on a scrap of paper in his pocket. Anyway, I'd be here reading this giant thing to you, but I would be consistently, systematically lying. It would be like you were watching me, but I were Fox News. The church was like Fox News back then. I would be saying, I'd be reading to you, you have to give money to me, otherwise you won't get to heaven. You have to do this. You have to do penance when the word in the Bible actually was to repent. You have to do that. You have to engage in charity 
you have to give money to the church when the Greek word actually meant to love. For confess, which is what the church said it wanted, this Tyndale fellow gave us the simpler and more personal and more accurate acknowledge. Tyndale was a genius. Uh, ultimately, his work with the Bible um, gave the English language as many idioms as Shakespeare gave us. He knew seven languages, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic. He was completely devout. When he's in jail, okay, for two years, just about, he converts his jailer and his jailer's family. Um, anyway, this system of lies and, and uh, toxic information that uh, he was born into, he would have none of it. So he wades through the Bible from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22, not only owning the thing uh, upon pain of death, not uh, translating the thing upon pain of death, but printing and distributing it upon pain of death. And he worked with all the publishing technologies of his day connecting personally with book designers, paper suppliers, printers, boat captains, horsemen across 16th century Europe, the YouTubes, the Twitters, the websites back then, uh, to bring the knowledge and the book that contained it into the hands of the people. They chased him down and they killed him for it. Anyway, that's just the opening. <laughs> that's, that's just the happy opening of this book. Um, the battle of knowledge against ignorance, uh, truth versus lies is not new. The problem's been around for uh, a long time. The third point is we've been let out of darkness before. The time I like best, the time you know I move into talking about in chapter two was, was the enlightenment. It really has kind of left a mark on us that time. Uh, Newton's physics, Montesquieu's laws, Linnaeus's taxonomies, Rousseau's political philosophy, the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And at the heart of it, there was no greater offering to truth and reason, perhaps, than the 22 million word encyclopedie that the French Enlightenment philosophers, 22 million words, uh, started writing, compiling, and offering to the public, publishing in 1750. It's amazing, not just from a content assembly perspective, an effort to gather all the world's knowledge and to print and publish it, but also from a socio-political one, given the powerful forces that were suppressing knowledge and the, you know, that would get provoked by such an action and did. The encyclopedie found the state and the church banning at one time or another almost every one of its 72,000 articles, 18,000 pages, and 28 volumes, and invoking a hundred ways to forbid its distribution. The act of doing this to compile all the world's knowledge and pack it into one uh, place that could be published, distributed, shared, was mind-blowing, but so was what was inside. The encyclopedia smoked all the 18th century orthodoxies. No proposition can be accepted as divine revelation, they wrote in the article on reason, if it contradicts what is known to us, either by immediate intuition or by obvious deductions of reason. It would be ridiculous to give preference to such revelations. This is in the late 1700s. The entry for fortune spotlighted the gross inequalities of wealth that were already evident in 18th century Europe. In the article on the slave trade, they wrote, and this is the 1750s again, mind you, the purchase of Negroes to reduce them into slavery violates all religion, morals, natural law, and human rights. But even more, the encyclopedia announced from day one that the giant project would be, as we say today, fact based, how there would be an underlying and overarching commitment to the verification of all source materials. Verification is a long and painful process, Dennis Diderot wrote in his introduction to the whole enterprise, the famous preliminary discourse. We have tried as much as possible, he said, to avoid this inconvenience by citing directly in the body of the articles the authors on whose evidence we have relied 
and by quoting their own text when it is necessary. What this meant in practice was revolutionary. There would be no accepted truths, but for those that could be proven and cited. And there's a lesson for today in there. The way out of it for us today is to publish as much as we can that's factual, true, and verifiable. And this is my fourth point. And this is why it's so good um, to be speaking with Peter Suber today. Verification is a key for us to get out of this mess. And so is freely publishing material online. Diderot's commitment to reference, to citation, to verification, continues in the Enlightenment's most important successor project, which is Wikipedia, founded by Jimmy Wales and his colleagues 20 years ago this year. It's the foundation of what today's Wikipedia terms verifiability, and in many ways, it's likely to be the foundation for truth in knowledge and society today online. Verifiability, and I'm reading from Wikipedia's statement of principles, means that material added to Wikipedia must have been published previously by a reliable source. Editors may not add their own views to articles simply because they believe them to be correct and may not remove sources' views from articles simply because they disagree with them. Verifiability is a necessary condition, a minimum requirement for the inclusion of material, though it is not a sufficient condition. It may not be enough. Wikipedia, of course, is one of the world's most uh, popular websites. It's the world's most popular non-commercial one. And it's an irreplaceable source of verifiable information, open to any and open to all. The Internet Archive is another. And it's actually working together with Wikipedia now, digitizing books so that links to sources in Wikipedia link all the way through to the books themselves and render images and text on the cited pages. So in a Wikipedia article on Martin Luther King Jr., for example, the reference link to a biography of Reverend King by Taylor Branch now hot links to the entire readable book online. That work is essential. Can we take it? Can we take verifiability further now, especially as this crisis, this epistemic crisis deepens? Information about vaccines online, literally a pox on our house now, about elections, same. Can we improve citation for the medium that's beginning to overtake us all, which is video? Can we make resources on the web fundamentally verifiable. What does a citation look like, sound like in a, in a podcast? These are our tech challenges and they're super important. Again, why? Because the use of footnotes <laughs> and the research techniques associated with them, as Princeton's great historian Anthony Grafton writes, makes it possible, and I'm quoting from one of his books, makes it possible to resist the efforts of modern governments tyrannical and democratic alike, to conceal the compromises they have made, the deaths they have caused, the tortures they and their allies have inflicted, which takes us back in a way to where we started. Um, finally, uh, and talking about this uh, in Cambridge is of course, again, a special pleasure. We all have a role to play uh, in this. Um, Cambridge, Boston is a place rich uh, in universities, museums, libraries, archives. Consider the things that we possibly can share with one another, the direct objects of what we want to share, the a photograph, um, uh, the image of an artwork, maybe uh, from a museum, a musical score, a piece of music, uh, a manuscript, metadata an artifact, a museum wall card, uh, a museum catalog, sounds and moving images. Property is the term that we use for it, intellectual property more specifically. Uh, and you know, this last point that I wanna make is that the, the copyright law that first came around to describe all this stuff, the uh, statute of Queen Anne also came around during the enlightenment. At the same time as Montesquieu, and Rousseau and Jefferson were getting busy. 
And at the same time that Isaac Newton was formulating his laws of motion while observing apples, uh, while he was at home uh, in his orchard during a plague like this one uh, we're in, in, in 1665, which shut down the other Cambridge. Um, just as Newton figured out that apples fall to the ground ultimately because of gravity and the laws of motion that he started writing up uh, in the early 1700s. So the people who wrote Queen Anne's law at the same time, and most of the laws that have followed recognized that when all is said and done, an idea, a human creation, art, culture, science also fall by their nature, by nature into the public domain. There's a physics of intellectual property, which I talk about in here. And that should give us some hope uh, that, that there's a natural order to things, that the state of nature of all the things we curate is ultimately the commons. And sometimes we just have to give it a little push to get it there. So this is a, this is a book about um, power. Uh, as Audrey said, it's a book about the monsters who try to uh, take it away from us. But it's also about the power that we actually have. Um, and that's the main part of it. That's the last sort of third of the book. We have to be aware of both of these things. The power that's sitting on top of our necks, if I can go there. Um, uh, but also the power that we have. And if we're aware of both of these things, the challenges, um, which Peter Suber has been writing and, and, and talking about and activating communities about for years, um, we have to re-examine our terms of service agreements with the technologies that we use with the publishers and with the producers we work with, um, and especially with others, wherever we are, wherever they are. We have to recreate um, some new covenants with um, our readers, if we're publishers, our visitors, if we're museums, um, our students, our teachers, if we're universities um, or other educational institutions, our viewers, if we're public broadcasters or any kind of broadcasters. We are actors and signatories, de facto and de jure um, in, this, in this new enlightenment social contract um, that we find ourselves working on today. But we're also its authors and uh, we should all of us um, get to writing when we're, um, made aware of all of these pressures that exist upon us and all of the opportunities that in fact we have with the technologies um, and other powers uh, at our disposal. So um, thank you, you know, again for the attention and the time uh, today. Um, and I, you know, I would love to launch us into some discussion. Um, um, during this lunch hour. Thank you, Peter. It's an honor for me to be here. And uh, I thank Peter Kaufman for that uh, introduction for his book. And I thank the bookstore for hosting this event. But let me pause first and say something to the audience. I will get things started by asking a question or two to Peter, but after that, uh, he'll be responding to your questions. Uh, please post them to the Q&A panel in Zoom, not to the chat. <clears throat> okay, and now just to get started, uh, Peter, you cover a lot of territory. And for those on the call who have not yet read the book, let me just mention some of the topics that he covers because he didn't mention them all in his introduction. Uh, he covers William Tyndale's translation of the Bible into English. He covers Diderot's encyclopedia. He covers the literary underground in Eastern Europe during the Cold War. He covers educational television, Wikipedia, the internet archive, open educational resources, and the projects by the growing number of museums to digitize their art and share it online. Uh, in every case, in every one of those areas, he finds what he calls monsters, uh, threats to the projects themselves, threats to the people, 
behind those projects. So here's my question, Peter. <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, many of the monsters you identify in those different topic areas have different motives for suppressing knowledge, different motives for uh, uh, threatening the people behind the projects, different rationales. Can you disentangle those? Can you distinguish different motives and rationales and uh, see what kind of family they form? Um, I think it would be a great project to do that kind of thing. Um, there is a word, it's not phylogenesis, but it's some other word for a family tree. Um, if you go to the Museum of Natural History, um, you can actually see one of the largest uh, displays of one of those of life, you know, the history of life. And it would be um, a ph phenomenal exercise to actually, um, you know, create a phylogenetic tree of monstrosity that would um, diagram uh, these different branches of people in different places, in different times, with different reasons, who um, uh, have really done their best to just keep us from uh, knowledge and from sharing knowledge. Um, can I disentangle them here? That's tough. That's a tough one. It's a great. It's a great exercise. Um, I just published a piece yesterday. Audrey mentioned the Knowledge Futures Group, which is an um, outstanding uh, spin-off that uh, was incubated for a while at MIT. Uh, that that um, uh, hosts a, a, a publishing um, uh, platform. One of them is PubPub, uh, where my book is available, um, open access. The entire book will be available next week uh, to read. Doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it, way cooler to buy it, help Harvard, help authors. But um, um, but in this piece, which appeared in The Commonplace, which is a sort of sister um, platform to PubPub, um, I talk about these new branches of information science that could you know, exist maybe uh, riffing off the physics of intellectual property. Um, so I imagine like, you know what would what would that discipline actually look like? The physics. What could there be? A, could there be? Is there a chemistry of information? Could there be a periodic table that would be that would uh, you know allow us to understand certain types of verifiable information versus other types? Are they stable? Are they isotopes? Like, um, uh, I think maybe I've been around too many people at MIT for too long. Like a, a periodic table for for information um, and a few other branches I, I go on about, but I, I hadn't thought about this one, which is a kind of, um, yeah, a family tree of monsters, um, which uh, I, I'd love to do, um, but I, I don't know that I can, I mean, I'll say one more word about it because it's such a great question. Like there are, I mean, Power and profit are probably the driving forces, you know, um, behind a lot of it. Um, and there are people who want to remain in power, kings, popes. Um, uh, but there are also people maybe closer to today where in the States anyway, as far as I remember, we don't have a king anymore or a, um, or a church leader per se. Um, you know, who are motivated maybe by profit. Um, and so maybe those are the, maybe those are the, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm trying to design the tree right now, but I can't. By uh, mentioning the possibility of a family tree, you're suggesting that these different motives might be historically related. And that's a very interesting hypothesis. I, I, again, I'd love to see you try to uh, work that through. But some of the motives that you seem to surface in the book are profit and power. Some of them are control. Maybe that's another word for power. Uh, some are political intolerance. Some are ideological certitude. Uh, some seem to me to be uh, 
bureaucratically thick, inept regulation. Uh, and some seem to be uh, ideological opposition to regulation as such. Uh, and offhand, it doesn't look like all of those are historically related, uh, although they might be causally related. Uh, and it just raises the question, is there more than one monster? Um, rather than one monster verse, uh, one uh, unified uh, enemy of the free circulation of knowledge? Oh, um, boy. You know, first of all, I'm going to say I look at another great question, but I look forward to turning it back to you to understand your, your thoughts about it as a uh, you know longtime professor of philosophy uh, and activist in this area. But I, I I would say the monster verse that I speak of is just a it's a nifty you know kind of basket um, phrase for all of these. You know, I wrote something else uh, after I finished the book um, on open culture, where you know I've, I've been doing a series, the, the the website Open Culture, which I love, out of Stanford. Um, shout out to my friend Dan Coleman who runs it. Um, uh, where I, you know, the first piece was thinking about all of these book series that have captured the imagination of children around the world, Harry Potter, the Lord of the Rings, you know. Um, and there, there always is this kind of heinous, dark, um, evil um, that, you know, the forces of good are battling against. Um, half our office at MIT Open Learning is consumed with Star Wars, you know. Star Wars is the same. Um, uh, what a, what a what a picture! What a series uh, in filmic media. Um, and I think I think what I'm what I'm trying to get at is, you know, whatever the monster looks like today, um, and sounds like, uh, and whatever it does. Um, it's related to what the monsters have been doing, you know, since uh, I don't know when. Like they were, they were, they were sacking the Library of Alexandria and ripping out these things and lighting them on fire um, to, uh, you know, to heat the baths of the marauding soldiers that it, that 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 attack. These are these are um, these are the same. Somehow, there's some common denominator. I don't know uh, how best to put it. And, you know, once again, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I don't want to turn the spotlight on me, but in my work for open knowledge, uh, I see many obstacles and it's more useful to uh, address them uh, in light of their strength than their historical relations. Uh, again, when I mention that power and uh, uh, profit may not be historically related. I didn't mean that they're not connected. I meant <clears throat> they're not connected as parent and child. Uh, power and profit have always coexisted uh, and they probably reinforce each other. They're probably reciprocal rather than parent and child. And the obstacles open knowledge faces uh, may be related in exactly that way, but <clears throat> uh, they take a different form uh, in different uh, academic disciplines in different countries and different economic strata. Uh, and it's best to understand their particularity if you're going to strategize around them. <clears throat> uh, I don't have a unified theory of monsters or of obstacles to free knowledge, but <clears throat> uh, I do think pluralism helps to uh, take seriously the actual obstacles you face. But I don't wanna take too much of the floor, but let me follow up with one more question and then I can turn to some of those that are uh, appearing in the Q&A panel. Um, I'm thinking about the differences between the first enlightenment and the new enlightenment that you're calling for. Uh, lots has changed since then. And you close with some uh, goals and principles for bringing about a new enlightenment uh, as if you had grounds for hope. <clears throat> uh, and yet you do talk about efforts in the digital age, uh, the contemporary age uh, for a new enlightenment and you find monsters there too. And certainly power and profit are present today. So they have not disappeared. So 
What are your grounds for hope <clears throat> if power and profit and the other monsters have not disappeared? Um, so that one comparatively is an, is an easier question for me. First, um, just like rhetorically, I wanna say that in the preface to this book, I quote um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who, who you know, wrote the original uh, social contract, um, was a peculiar fellow, um, but also wrote these memoirs, what he called his confessions. And he wrote, you know, I guess I, I address this, how can, how can one possibly write a book of hope now, to your point? Um, and Rousseau put in his confessions this sentence, if I want to describe the spring, it must be in winter. If I want to describe a fine landscape, I must be within doors. And as I've said a hundred times, if ever I were confined in the Bastille, there I would draw the picture of liberty. But substantively, I would say um, this, you know, uh, we are, what is it? Uh, yeah, I need a slide rule, but um, 600, 700, 600 plus years into the age of print. Um, the Enlightenment, the original Enlightenment was called the Republic of Letters. Um, and look how we fouled it up. I mean, look, you know, when, when you guys got together almost 20 years ago, 19 years ago to do the open access declaration in Budapest, you know, what a world you were dealing with then. Look how many um, um, forces existed at that time, exist today in the print universe, in the book world, uh, um, no offense, Harvard bookstore, um, in the journal world, um, in the world of scholarly communications as it was defined then and as in many ways it's still defined now. Um, look how many tortured contracts existed, how many knots in copyright law and practice um, policy had been tied up. Now we're um, only 120, 25 years into what I'm calling like the new enlightenment, whatever, the Republic of images, not the Republic of letters. Um, most of us in this Zoom today, you know, first of all, we're talking over video. Um, second, we, you know, we have the capacity to connect ourselves with video and record and preserve and, and share and publish um, all kinds of stuff on video. And so, you know, I work at MIT, Open Learning, which, which um, is also celebrating 20 years uh, of MIT Open Courseware, one of the great dramatic interventions in, in sharing, uh, where we put now 2,500 courses online, um, absolutely for free from MIT uh, for the world forever, uh, anywhere you are. Um, you know, I think there might be an opportunity for us to look at uh, the audiovisual um, medium, the medium through which we're communicating now, the medium through which we're doing a lot of teaching and learning during this pandemic, willful or not, um, you know, and, and, and try to, perhaps with the help of some of our friends within public media, and there's no greater, you know, I should have said right at the outset, like, Cambridge and Boston, not only home to all of these extraordinary museums and universities and what have you, but it also happens to be home to perhaps the, the greatest public media enterprise anywhere in the world. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it rivals the, uh, it rivals, uh, the BBC and HK, which is WGBH. And just this week, you know, um, WGBH together with the Library of Congress release the original archival interviews um, from a great series on the history of the civil rights movement, 14 hours uh, the series was, the 
rough material is hundreds of hours um, called Eyes on the Prize. Um, can, we, can we look at ourselves now 100 years into you know, uh, this world before we get to be 650 years old and try to figure out ways of making sure we don't mess up? I use saltier language in the book. Um, mess up the audiovisual uh, universe in the way that we somehow allowed the print universe to have all of these constraints built in that we somehow accept. Um, we should, uh, you know, take another crack at it. And um, my hope is that uh, if we collectivize a bit, we 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 um, we will. Uh, thanks. I'm not going to follow up with a question. Uh just an observation, that was a very good enlightenment answer because it was empirical. That is one ground for hope uh, is that we've been succeeding. Uh, some initiatives have been working. Uh, I'll just point out, uh, you document very well that earlier initiatives also seem to be succeeding for quite a while until they were demolished, <coughs> uh, stamped out. Okay, I think it's time to turn to questions from the audience. Uh, here's one from an anonymous participant. How can this power and fight for information change the broken college system in the United States? Um, great, great question. Uh, you know, yeah. In many ways, the whole education system is broken. And I don't know that, you know, uh, the recipes for fixing it, uh, are in my book, in this conversation, in all of what we can think of together today alone. But um, I think if we uh, commit ourselves to sharing the knowledge that comes out of these great institutions, um, that comes out of institutions that are not as old as Harvard or or founded in the crucible of war, like M MIT, um, um, you know, that are more recent. Um, if there are ways of more systematically connecting between the institutions that uh, are wealthy and the ones that are not, the ones that are old and the ones that are new, um, the, you know, community colleges that uh, it, go about educating so many people um, uh, in ways that when we think of higher education, sometimes, you know, especially in Cambridge, that's a downside, I guess. Uh, we don't always talk about. Um, boy, is there room for improvement? Um, so, you know, if I had one sort of thing to impart, it would be to kind of blow into those conversations. Um, the hope that we were discussing in the very last, you know, part of our conversation, um, to try and see, to try and empower us with the knowledge that we should be working toward those goals, that we can work together uh, toward those goals, and that there are opportunities for resources and support. Um, you know, we're still, I don't know about you guys, all of you, but uh, Peter, you, uh, we're still kind of, you know, post-traumatic stress from the Trump years. Um, but, you know, as someone put it on Twitter the other day, how do you like this new administration? You know, vac vaccines for everybody and trillions of dollars for infrastructure. So I think there is some, you know, opportunity for hope and I think um, hope and collective action and confidence, I guess, in our own power um, are, are really at the key to transforming the educational system. Sorry if that's a watery answer. Uh, thank you, Peter. There's one more question in the Q&A panel. Uh, and before I read it, let me just urge people to post their own questions. Uh, if you don't, you're gonna get more of mine. Okay, here's the next one. Could you say more about the physics of knowledge and the physics of information? I'm intrigued because in the world of data visualization, when one builds a knowledge graph or a visualization of network information through software, there is actually a physics engine behind the visualization that determines the layout and display of related entities and information. 
Um, sure, I can, but I would, I would tell you, I'd much rather hear from, hear from, from you about that physics engine uh, than prattle on, uh, you know, about some kind of funky, uh, funky metaphor. Um, the, the, the book is, um, has probably 30 or 40 pages, my book probably has 30 or 40 pages on um, this physics of intellectual property, give or take. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it involves discussions of information as something that's always in motion. Um, and it is a, you know, uh, it would be a, a dream to actually get together with a couple of physicists. There's no shortage of those either in this town. And, and um, maybe whoever is asking this question, data, data visualization, and think about how one could actually map, um, you know, the, the, the physics of, of information. Um, my main point is that, and it also is a source for hope. So who knew that hope would be such a topic today? <laughs> but but um, uh, that the destiny of human creativity is really in the commons. That's like a, that to me is like a, if it's true, if it's like, if that's also, you know, possibly empirically accurate, that's a kind of breathtaking concept that we had actually articulated copyright law with that point in mind and that, in some ways, despite all of the restrictions, the contracts, the agreements, in print, in you know the complex audiovisual con, look at a look at the number of agreements in a rights bible for a documentary, for example, you, you'll uh, you'll pass out. Um, if that's really the point of it all, um, that's kind of mind blowing. Um, so that all these things like apples on the ground, you know, land there um, in, in the commons. The difference being that, or maybe it's the same because then you dip into biology. I don't know exactly what happens to apples once they get onto the ground, what do they do there? But in the commons anyway, the, the information becomes shareable um, and shareable again forever. So um, yeah, I'd love to talk about that some uh, more. But uh, hopefully that's the start, uh, start. Good, thank you. Now, here's a new question. Do you think it's possible to combat the spread of in misinformation when the democratized digital landscape of publishing means that format of false information is often indistinguishable from true information to an untrained or uninformed observer? Yeah, it's a great question. I. I I do think it's possible. I, I not only think it's possible, I think it's um, um, it's our responsibility, uh, whoever we are, scholars, authors, publishers, booksellers, to figure out ways of doing that. Um, and the nub is in the how, you know? Um, and, and one of the answers that I go on about um, is like, if there were a way to know when a, when a when a congressman stands up and you're watching him on C-SPAN, a bunch of us have been involved in projects like this, by the way, in the same way as, you know, you watch uh, race car drivers going around the track or in their, you know, uh, um, suits when they are out of their cars and their like logos of all of their sponsors everywhere. If there were a way to, as someone's talking, right, um, on video, on television, on whatever you're watching, like have at the time that they're speaking a sense of who is contributing to their position, to their election campaign, that those sources that are relevant to the topics that are being spoken of at that moment, almost like live annotation uh, you know, which follows the money. Um, I think that would be interesting if you imagine today, if we're all going to watch like this Hemingway uh, film of Ken Burns uh, that's coming out. Uh, 
premiering in a few days. The credits are all at the end, right? Uh, I made a point and, you know, kudos to the publisher at Seven Stories Press in New York, and Dan Simon, who is the, the head of it, of making sure that my, you know, footnotes were footnotes uh, at the bottom. Uh, there will be ways 125 years into this medium of, you know, audiovisual medium that we're talking over today, to have footnotes appearing at the same time, to have source materials appearing at the same time uh, in audiovisual uh, media, so that you don't have to wait for the end of the movie to see where this was shot or where this image came from or where this piece of music or local news footage uh, surfaced out of. Um, and I think we can do a lot more with um, text today online than we've done. Um, there are all kinds of initiatives, uh, you know, um, to further this kind of work, uh, but they need to be, um, yeah, they need to be given a few steroids today. Thanks, Peter. We have a new question from Edward Imbier. Do you have any thoughts on how copyright law should be written to be more fair to authors, publishers, and the common good? Yeah, so the first, thanks for that question. It's a great question. And, uh, you know, once again, they're like, there are a few law schools in this town, a few lawyers um, as well, uh, and professors of law who, you know, um, can, can, um, can address this far better than I can. The first book talk that I gave was on the day this book was released five weeks ago, February uh, 23rd, I think it was, um, at the uh, University of California, Berkeley's um, Law and Information School uh, at the invitation of a hero of mine, um, Pam Samuelson, uh, who teaches copyright law. And, you know, when I was done talking, she, she was like, so should the First Amendment be rewritten? You know, it's a different talk. And, you know, I'm like, I'm talking to one of the great, you know, or present anyway, was one of the great, is one of the great scholars of the First Amendment and of law and copyright law in particular. Um, I, I'm not sure what the answer is to that question, but I'm pretty sure that the beginnings of the answer lie in reinforcing the point and recognizing it everywhere that copyright is, is uh, a great vehicle um, for generating progress, uh, for generating maybe even power and profit, you know, uh, as good things sometimes. Uh, often, um, but in, in the end, like um, in the end, where you know, is it ridiculous that you know we can't quote a Simon and Garfunkel song in in um, you know in in a documentary uh, without jumping through hurdles about it, or you know, isn't that part of our common intellectual? human heritage. Um, so I don't know, I think, I think we need to um, kind of underscore the intentions of copyright law and be emboldened by those original uh, visions uh, of it. There's, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. I will say one other thing, which is Creative Commons, which is mentioned in this um, book at some length. Uh, it, it remains, to be proven to me why a system like Creative Commons can't evolve in the same way that time affects copyright sometimes, right? If you're the, the, the right situation on one of these books in back of me may be different from one of these other books simply because of what year it was published or the author died or whatever. Could Creative Commons licenses sh shift so that for five years, a, common, a, a license is under these terms. Uh, for the next five years, it's 
there's some perhaps more liberal terms. And for the remainder of its time, um, it is under perhaps the most liberal or something like that. Uh, I think that, that the question of time, uh, which is, this is also a book about time, I think, um, um, is, is vital to understand as part of the answer to that question. Good, thank you. <clears throat> We've only got four minutes uh, and there are no questions in the panel. So here's one from me. And if it takes longer than four minutes, feel free to just cut it off. Uh, but maybe some people can stay on longer. It seems to me that uh, many of us, including you and I, were more excited about the potential for digital media and the internet uh, to create a new enlightenment when they were new uh, than we are today. That is, between then and now, we've seen more uh, threats, risks, hazards, obstacles uh, than we saw then. And so this is the flip side of my question of your grounds for hope. Uh, what are your grounds for pessimism? Uh, and what are the most important specific uh, threats or obstacles that we should pay attention to in order to uh, avoid them? How much time do we have? Grounds for pessimism? Come on. A couple days, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I guess the grounds for pessimism that I have that are the most sort of substantial involve it's super hard to imagine reform of the regulations that have been chipped chiseled away at for 30 40 years um uh without reform of the political system that in part governs us and governs how regulations are enacted and enforced. And those political systems, and I speak specifically of the second branch of government, like it are, um, are um, corrupt. So, uh, you know, and it turns out that the number one lobbyist as the book, you know, explores in Washington is the parent of Google and Facebook isn't far behind, you know, in terms of the size and dollar amounts that is being poured in to efforts. Um, where are we going to find the people who are unbought, you know, who are, um, I think that's key. And that's a generational issue. So it also involves considerations of time. It is inconceivable to me that we can engage in the, you know, we talked a little bit about Eastern Europe. Um, there's a whole chapter in here, um, and it's how I, you know, first encountered Carol Horn, whom I gave a shout out to at the at the beginning of this talk. Um, you know, Timothy Garton Ash wrote a lot for the New York Review of Books in the uh, '90s. Talked about the system of Eastern Europe, the communist totalitarian regimes put in as turning what used to be an aquarium, lively and vivacious into fish soup. And how do you return <laughs> from fish soup back into an aquarium? That can't be done overnight. God knows how to do it. Um, it's happening in weird ways over in that part of the world today. But I think that um, when you look at our own systems, uh, that you know the macro systems that exist to regulate uh, laws, rules, um, other systems of information, education, expression of all kinds here. Um, there are lots of grounds for pessimism because the regulators or the people who legislate or the people who adjudicate um, are so corrupt. I think we need to, yeah, be good to get some new people in here. So I, I hope some folks in this call are 25 years old. Well, I think that's about all we have time for today, but um, thank you so much for joining us and having this really impeccable conversation. Um, and thank you for sharing your time. And thank you to everyone at home who's watching today and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling and our incredible staff.
here at Harvard Bookstore. If you, go, you would like to support Peter and the bookstore, check out the link in the chat. You can purchase a copy of The New Enlightenment and the Fight to Free Knowledge. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. From all of us at Harvard Bookstore, be well and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.